If art isn't going to challenge the status quo, what is going to challenge the status quo? Mm. If you have to think about what you're writing, if you have to think about what you're saying, is this going to offend someone? Mm -hmm. Is this going to is this going to not is this going to get shut? Is this play going to get shut down if I have that opinion? Mm -hmm. Is my film not going to get any funding if I if I write this thing mm -hmm. in it? I think the rejection and the and the not getting ahead it comes to it becomes too much when your life is just acting. Mm -hmm. It's all right being fantastic in your living room on your own, but like, can you do it when it means a lot? Mm. when the contract is 50 grand like mm. can you still do it then i actually felt something for real that's never happened mm -hmm. before and i'm like there you go that's it that's mm. what we're here for that's what i'm here for mm. that's why i'm doing it i'm not doing it for any other reason do you know what i mean like that's you just had a real connection you just had a real connection with yourself you just felt something real out of nothing people live their life in that mold of not actually ever interacting not actually ever communicating for real mm -hmm. and then i'm asking them to communicate for real and they actually don't know how to do it. Like literally people don't know how to communicate for real. Yeah. And that is like, fuck, what, what's going on in society? The thing that stops people from being really good is their desire to be really good. And is their desire to succeed. Mm -hmm. They want it so bad that when it matters, the pressure but David Mamet doesn't believe in character at all. Mm -hmm. I will talk about character. Mm -hmm. David Mamet's just like, there's no such thing as character. That's in his book. There is no such thing as character. Mm -hmm. but that's helpful for me. I, I'm like, yeah, of course. Then it makes me feel like, oh, I just need to be me. Mm -hmm. But for some, for some people, they're just like, they lose their fucking heads if you say there's no such thing as character. <laughs> they never they never come back to class. <laughs> really? This this is crazy. It's a, it, it's a cult. What, what else do you hate about the industry? <laughs> Hi, my name is Andrew Rogozin and this is Beyond Real Talk, a podcast where I invite real entertainment industry professionals and ask them real questions. What are they actually doing? How are they doing it? Why are they doing it? And how can you start doing the same thing? My today's guest is uh, an actor, a writer, producer, director, musician, acting teacher, a founder of a Working Actors Studio, mm -hmm. and of course, the most of all, my good friend, Lee Lomas. That was a fucking, that was a monologue, mate. I know, right? It's like, I had to learn it. Nice. How are you, man? I haven't seen you for a long time. Yeah, I'm good. Um, good. 2024 is actually um, feeling like, you know, pretty positive, pretty, pretty motivated, pretty yeah. energized. I've been told that's because Pluto is no longer in our orbit. Um, Maybe that's the <clears throat> secret now for, for our success, man. <laughs> well, exactly. So now I, I've got into the habit of just every now and again when something good happens, I just go Pluto. <laughs> I just sort of, I just, I just shout out to the to the uh, Pluto All right. gods for, for, the, for this <laughs> for this good year so far. But we are only in February, so yeah, plenty of time for it to go on. Okay, look, we have a lot of stuff to talk about, <laughs> but let's start. It's a show about Pluto. <laughs> <laughs> no, we can talk about Pluto as well. <laughs> it's not an astrology podcast, but why not? <laughs> Look, uh, you're from Manchester. Yeah. You're from working class family, right? Yeah. How did you become an actor and why? I tried, um, I tried some drama classes when I was about nine or 10 years old, um, because one of my friends, one of my good friends at the time was going. Um, and I think, I think I ended up crying in the class or something like that. I was just being proper wet and, um, you know, didn't really participate in the class and, you know, that was it. My, you know, my mum took me home or whatever. Um, but anyway, that friend continued to, to go to the drama classes and I went to see her do a performance. I think it was like a Christmas show or a fucking pantomime or something like that. Yeah. It just sort of, this was a couple of years later. I was probably about 11 or 12 and I was like, ah, that's what I want to do. Not like pantomimes. I want a career in pantomime. Um, but I wanted to be on the stage. I wanted to be performing. And I mm -hmm. sort of, yeah, was re-inspired by that. So then I went back to those to those drama classes. It was a weekly class, um, two-hour workshop. Carol Godby's theatre workshop still going in Bury. A lot of people, have, a lot of, lot of people have gone through there. Um, and yeah, and she, she ended up becoming my agent pretty much as soon as I joined, actually, within a week or two. Mm. She um, she signed me up and then I started doing extra work and that was that really was the, the beginning of it. But, you know, um, props to my mum for, 
um, funding that because, you know. How, how old were you in the band? Um, when I joined? Yeah. 12, 13. Right. Mm. So yeah. you, you've been in the industry for, for quite a while. Yeah, yeah, too long, really. <laughs> <laughs> 20, 20 years. 20 years. 20 years of, of, of heartbreak. Yeah, and the rejection. Constant and rejection. rejection. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. 20 years of heartbreak and rejection. All right, so so basically that's like you you knew that you want to be an actor since you were just a kid. Yeah. All right, yeah. nice. And then how did you go? When, when uh, What did you do after school? So like when, where did you study acting after that? Um, I went to college mm -hmm. to do performing arts, um, went to Berry College, which I think at the time was like one of the top colleges in the country for performing arts, which... I didn't really know when I was applying. Um, and yeah, that was that was very much more like musical theatre orientated, I guess. Uh, you had to act, dance and sing. You could choose a pathway which you wanted to focus on predominantly, which I chose acting. But I nearly dropped out. I, I really didn't like the first two or three months. Um, Why? Sorry? Why? Um, I was never very good with with the schooling system. Um, I've always had bad attention spans. I was very badly behaved as a child. Uh, around that time of going to college, I was involved like doing a lot, like going out on the street and just sort of knocking around on the street and doing all that kind of shit. Um, and sort of going to college was a bit like, um, you know, this is my opinion now, but going to college at that time was like, it was gay. And a lot of people around mm -hmm. me was like, what are you dancing and singing? Like, mm -hmm. what, what the fuck? Like, mm -hmm. you know, I got a lot of shit for that. I got a lot of shit for that when I started acting, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I used to try and hide the fact that I went to acting classes when I was mm -hmm. at high school. Because if people found out you did drama, they just called you gay. Is it because of like your, like the surroundings where you lived? Like it, it wasn't like that, like everywhere probably, right? Yeah, obviously very sort of working class town, rough town. Um, you know, people don't, people don't do acting mm -hmm. from, from there. Like, yeah. you, you don't do acting or dancing and singing unless you're gay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, that's, that's what the gay kids do. Yeah. Um, which obviously, you know, s small town mindset. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I carried, you know, I carried some of those belief systems, I guess, into, into college and dancing and singing was a step too far for me. Like mm -hmm. I felt extremely uncomfortable doing those mm -hmm. things singing in front of people, dancing in front of people. I was just like, what the fuck is this? Like, mm. it was so different from everybody that I knew. Yeah. Um, so that I rebelled against it. Um, I rebelled against some of the tutoring from an acting point of view. I'd already started working in TV at this point and I was a bit like, fucking Shakespeare. Like, what, like, what are you talking about? Like, breaking down a script. I'm just like, give me the script, let me read the lines. Like, what the fuck, what is this? Mm. Um, which obviously didn't go down very well. Um, so yeah, by the Christmas, I was ready to leave at, at Christmas. Um, and luckily I had a tutor, Jules, who was the dance tutor. And she just sort of encouraged me, set me straight. She gave me a good talking to. I can't remember exactly what she said now. It's a long time ago, but like it was sort of, if you don't, if you drop out of college, What's your life going to look like? Well, like, what are you going to go and do at 16 years old mm -hmm. in this part of the world? Mm. And I was sort of like, okay. And I, I kind of got on board and then started making a bit of an effort. And then I actually, over time, really started to enjoy the dancing. And I started dancing and then I started singing a little bit more. And then like everything just changed for me then. Nice. Do you still dance? I never saw you dancing. No, you haven't <laughs> ever seen me dancing. No, I haven't danced for a long time. Recently, I've been thinking about to get back into it just for fun really just just because it's such a nice sort of like medium and an expression of art but um yeah maybe with my music i was thinking the other day i've got a track that i would like to do more of like a dance type music video and i thought i'll let the professional dancers do the majority of that but maybe i'll jump in and do, mm -hmm. do a little bit of something mm -hmm. i mean yeah you can learn like a few moves you know and just exactly dust off your skills <laughs> yeah yeah no, i mean it's gonna be pretty rusty now i think but yeah how much were you working basically working as an actor is during the, the college <sighs> during college i would have been doing a lot of extra work i think at that time mm. um did a fair a fair bit of that being on set um but i think it was 
during college that I did my first role in Shameless, which was my first professional, professional credit. The original Shameless, not the American not one. Not the American one. Well, I mean, to be fair, like I only watched American one, not full of, not full series. I, I gotta say, I loved it. I think American Shameless is good, but I haven't seen the original, so I can't judge which one is better. I haven't watched American Shameless, um, just because like that was the show that I absolutely loved when mm -hmm. I was young. Um, and it was a dream come true to get cast in Shameless, to be honest. I used mm. to watch it religiously and I loved it. So I, I just feel like I'm never going to be anything but disappointed watching the American Shameless. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that was my first gig. And I did a couple of other gigs in these a Channel 4 program, Drop the Gorgeous, it was called, and something else called Gold Plate. I can't remember what show that was on. But those were like, I was booked as an extra and then they sort of took a liking to me and then they bumped me up and gave me like a line or give me some action in one of those shows. I, th I think I killed the main character at the end of the series with like a, a bat to the head. So I've done a couple of more substantial parts, but being cast in Shameless was like my first gone to an audition, gone through that process. Mm -hmm. It was like, so I think, I think I was probably about 17 then, 16, 17. That's nice. Um, yeah, and I did, I did it twice. So that was like the first time. Mm. Um, so yeah, wasn't working a huge amount as like a proper actor during college. But I was on set quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, as an extra, which I think it's it's, it's a great idea to do some extra work when you're kind of trying to get into acting. Yeah. Because it's money and also like, you know how, like you learn how the set works, how yeah. everything works, which is great, yeah. yeah. Maybe maybe that's what I need to do right now <laughs> while I'm waiting for my big role. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I think you get, I think there's a fair amount of getting messed around these days. But mm -hmm. for me as a kid, it was great. I, didn't, I, got, I got to go out of school, I didn't have to go to school. I got paid. Mm -hmm. And those bits of extra work that I did as a teenager, that I paid for my first car and shit. So mm -hmm. and I was getting all that experience. And did you do a lot of theater at that time as well? Um, I did through college um, a fair bit of stage work. It was a really good course. It was much better than my university course, actually. It was very full on. It was full time. Um, so yeah, I, got, I started to get stage experience then, but my university degree was more theater orientated. Um, and I joined the theatre society at university and then we would do plays and musicals. More musicals than plays, to be honest. Um, I didn't really get into plays until I set up my own company when I was like, when I come out of uni at like mm. 21, 22. Mm. Yeah, it was more musicals and then TV outside of uni and college. Mm. Do you have a preference, stage or screen? I think screen, I think I see the world through the medium of screen, mm. through the medium of film. Um, and I think I always did, even when I started producing theatre. I produced theatre because it was too difficult to produce film at that time in my life. Mm. Um, yeah, I very much see the world as cinema, like constantly. Um, but I've had some good roles in TV, but I've never had like a a series regular in like a TV series where I could properly get stuck into the role mm -hmm. where on stage I've had that opportunity. Mm -hmm. So from an acting point of view so far, I've enjoyed the role, some of the roles that I've done on stage, like my, my most enjoyable roles have been on stage. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean I enjoy the medium of stage more than film. I yeah. just think that's to do with where I've been at in, in my career so far, opportunity wise. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, but in terms of like watching theatre, I fucking really don't like theatre. I don't like the way theatre's done in London. I yeah. think it's mostly shit where like, I like a lot of film. So, mm -hmm. yeah. But do, do you mean like theatre? Because in London, in, in UK, like there is like very, very big, like high end uh, plays that you could watch, like, and the, the yeah. production value there, like, it's, it's incredible as well. But it's still, you're not happy with it. <laughs> production value is great. But for me, acting, has always been about connection, human connection, mm -hmm. and this sense and this feeling of like relatability, um, a shared experience. And I reckon probably like a shared struggle is what I've always aired towards. And that's probably a reflection of my own life. It's this sort of like, oh, you're not alone in the world. Like I, and that's what I like about acting is like, you watch a film and you, and yeah, it's that, it's that relatability, it's that shared experience with another human being, but also it's entertainment. Um, and you can't move away from the fact that it's supposed to be entertainment, mm -hmm. but I just feel like the theater leans way too more towards entertainment and being like performative mm -hmm. rather than it being about connection. 
So when I watch theatre, I just watch actors acting and performing. And I'm just not interested in it. I just find it. I just find it to be empty and inauthentic. So, do you think it might be a byproduct of of or like actual media of the specifics of theater? Do you think it's much harder to kind of capture this very very intimate moments uh, in comparison to screen? Like when on, on screen, for example, you can you can have like a close up, very kind of intimate, quiet close up that kind of captures every single. Mm. movement on your face just every single emotion when like in theater you kind of you have to project you have to be loud you have to be you know like big enough for this for, for people like in the and the and row to see you properly yeah i think that definitely plays a part and um i think one of the biggest challenges of theater that i've seen as an actor but also as a director is how do you hold on to your how, how do you hold on to yourself Mm -hmm. when you're having to perform and you're having to accentuate your voice and your physicality. But I think it is possible. But I think people end up thinking, oh, I'm on stage now, so I have to be big and I have to be a character. And a lot of the way that people direct is like, the show has to be the exact same way, which I get because you go into a running time, you can't be fucking freestyling here, there and everywhere. But I think it tends to then lead the actors down a road of just being like in a rehearsal. So I'm just, I'm saying the lines at you, you're mm -hmm. saying the lines at me. We did it like that yesterday. We did it like that the day before. Mm -hmm. This is the show. We've got to make sure those people at the back here and see us. And the show becomes more about that rather than the, the, the immediacy and the spontaneity that I think it can have which makes live performance amazing. Like, mm. and when I see it done like that, I'm fucking blown away by it, but mm. it's so few and far between that I see it done like that. And you're right, on film, there's just more of an opportunity to exist. You also get more takes. Yeah. So you know you can just exist in that space and you can maybe try something a little bit different. But my opinion is you can do that on stage as well. It's just, just not thinking, the done thing. I'm just thinking that, for example, like on film, we, we see one take from like, maybe like one single, great take from 10 takes and maybe kind of sometimes in theater like you have 10 performances and you will see this one 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 performance that would be that amazing <laughs> but it's like you can't do it every night and in film you just you see this like the, the very best one selected and edited into the web pro so maybe that might be one of the reasons as well <laughs> yeah do you think well like, when, when, you perform, every night. when you performed like uh in theater yeah like do you think like every night Like, where did you have any runs when, like, every night was amazingly new? I think every night, especially in the last few years when I've done theater, maybe not early, earlier on, every night I found new things. Mm. Every night I've challenged myself, I've challenged the work, I've challenged the actors around me to find new things, to keep it fresh. Mm. That doesn't mean it's always good. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that doesn't mean that it always works. And I think that's why theater leans more towards that safe way of doing things. I'm like, well, that works. Oh yeah, the way you say that line, that works. Like, let's let's just lock that off. Mm. But I would just, I just think, have the courage to just fucking try something new, you know? At least let it be a real moment rather than a fucking rehearsed moment. I think some things might be locked. You can lock them. Like when it works, you can lock them for a couple, like two, three times and then, but like, I think then it stops working. <laughs> You'll still have to kind of, uh, find something new in it because yeah. sometimes like even in class when you were telling me sometimes like i've seen this like you did it like few few times and i was like yeah fair enough but sometimes it just feels like it's not like i'm, I'm doing it just because it works it's just because like it just feels natural because last time i did it not because i thought it will work it was kind of natural and then next time i'm doing it it kind of it still feels natural <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. Then, and then it can become stale of course but I, yeah i think I, i don't think it's about saying the lines in a different way every time i don't think it's that at all it's about saying the line to the other person every time mm -hmm. and i think it's so easy it becomes like a dance you almost get stuck in the choreography it's like this is the way i do the line and what happens is you say the line in the same way but up here you're not engaged mm -hmm. you're not engaged with that person yeah and that's what i mean that's what i see a lot of on theater is it's just a performance that i say this you say this you come on here i stand there we do this you pretend to cry blah, blah, and it's just like come on man fucking speak to the other person mm -hmm. like you, you don't have to say the line in a different way but if you're gonna ask like how are you mm -hmm. ask them how yeah. are you do you know what i mean like actually do that 
For so, me, that seems very simple and basic. So I just don't see. It, I just don't see it happen very often, mm-hmm. and I find it frustrating. Yeah, well, maybe how are you? Not it's not the best example because we don't ask how are you while actually asking how are you well, in the no. real world. No, unfortunately, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> that's what like it was a shock for me when I just moved to UK. Like everyone's like, how are you? I'm like, you really want me to tell you? Yeah, it's like because you know back in Latvia, yeah, we like we usually don't ask like we we can ask we can ask like how are you, but in general, like we never ask how are you someone who we don't know. <laughs> it's like no. what do you mean how are you? like you don't know me? <laughs> Who yeah, do you want yeah, me to yeah. tell you like a story of my life? So yeah, uh, but yeah, yeah, I understand what you mean. I understand what you mean. Um, well, do you do you like chicken? Hmm? Yeah, I'll give you a different example. Do you like chicken? <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, uh, I could fucking bang on about that for a while as well, though, like that sort of the going through the motions of life, that like sort of like asking people stuff and it all being surface level. Mm-hmm. And that's like a big hurdle that I have as a, as, a, as a coach and as a director. It's like people live their life in that mode of not actually ever interacting, not actually ever communicating for real. Mm-hmm. And then I'm asking them to communicate for real and they actually don't know how to do it. Like literally people don't know how to communicate for real. Yeah. And that is like, fuck, what, what's going on in society? Mm. Like, how can you, how can you ask someone how they are and actually not, not, not give a shit, but expect to just hear, yeah, I'm good. Mm. And then move on <laughs> with your life. Like, <laughs> I, I, what? Yeah. So where is the actual sort of, yeah, connection and communication gone? So. Do you think yeah. that was ever different? Um. I mean, like 50, 60 years ago, do you think? People Not 50, were... 60 years ago. No, I just, I think obviously with, with how much we've sort of like grown as a species and we're like, yeah, I, th- I read something about we, we operate best in communities of around 85, I think. I think that's where, like, that's what feels comfortable for human beings and anything past that is just like an overload of information, which is why we go through being like, how are you and not actually doing it? Because there's only so much fucking like connection we can take. But I guess way back, way back when we lived in little communities and little villages, then it probably would have been more time mm-hmm. because you would have had an actual interest in, yeah. in those people. So yeah, it was probably different then. Mm-hmm. But it's probably not been like that for fucking... Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not a big fucking historian, to be honest. So I don't know about... <laughs> but it's still, like, it's weird. Like if we think about like, so society is this way right now and we as actors should represent society as it is right now but at the same time we still have to break through this barrier of like of communication that kind of still go deeper than you would usually see between two people like in real life but on, yeah. on screen or like on, on stage we kind of we need this connection that is almost more like unrealistic in comparison to real society <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And again, that's another little hurdle as well of like, you know, sometimes we'll do a scene, you know, say we do a scene and it's between two policemen um, or a couple of nurses or whatever, you know, Um, you then have to factor in what you've just said then, like when people go to work, they very much go to work in a work mode. So Mm -hmm. like two people who are, are on the job, they're not necessarily going to be having this like more deep, like intimate connection and conversation. Like mm-hmm. they're at work. So it's, it's a bit more surface level and it's a bit more guarded. Mm-hmm. So then as an actor, you have to incorporate that as well. Yeah. So that's another dimension that you've got to sort of incorporate. So yeah, I want you to talk and listen for real, but also not be that interested because you're, <laughs> you know, you're, you're in, you're in policeman mode or whatever, but also yeah. don't play policeman mode because yeah, then yeah. we don't, then we just see an actor being kind of a policeman. <laughs> Hello. Um, <laughs> Which sometimes maybe that's what's needed because like yeah. if you're a pizza, if you're a pizza delivery guy, like you just, you just came in, brought the pizza, took money, fucked up. That's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's no, no deeper meaning to a character. No. no funny line. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But wait, to be honest, when you said that though, like the, the pizza delivery guy in Home Alone, Mm-hmm. Like that performance always stands out for no, me. I don't remember Come Alone. No. I haven't seen it for like his re- like 25 years. <laughs> his reaction to like, you know, people are like fucking flying around. No one's paying him and he's just a bit of pizzas. <laughs> and it's like, he's made something like that part, you know, it's like, a, it's a moment. I can picture it in my head. So yeah. there's no small, there's no small part. No, I mean like to, to be fair, like if it's a good writing, then this character needs to be there. Like, and there is a reason why. The characters are yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. there should be something. <laughs> uh, dude, honestly, man, like I, I, and I know that's one of the things that we work in the class a lot, like being yourself, 
you yeah. being you yeah. while, you know, playing the objective and everything and blah, 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 you know, like an intentions and everything. But I just I still sometimes like when I get castings of this, like I, f- I see like, okay, this is a casting for some stereotypical Russian bandit Ivan. It's very hard for me, like when I do the self tape, not to get into this mode of like, yeah. well, they want stereotypical Russian, but it, I will not give them stereotypical Russian, but it, I will, and maybe that's why I don't get a lot, a lot of roles lately. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that's true. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> but at the same time, you feel like you want to get into a kind want- of safer option, you know, because like, if I... <sighs> but why? Why? Why do that? Because there's going to be another, however many fucking Russian yeah, actors there are know, in London and the rest of the world. They're all going to pick it up and they're going to do that as well. Mm. So then the casting there out to just these fucking 20 Russian people or Latvian people <laughs> or people who are speaking Russian doing the Russian bad guy thing and then how do they choose? I'll tell you why because, well, why sometimes I feel like I, I kind of, I'm doing this because when I'm watching those TV shows, not all of them, but a lot of them, I see those stereotypical Russian guys. Yeah, 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 yeah. No. <laughs> That's the thing. Yeah. So I see them, I see the people booking their roles with doing this and I'm like, hey, maybe I should do this, I don't know. Yeah, well, maybe when they booked the role, they didn't. They didn't do it like that. Maybe that. Maybe that's just how it was directed. Once they were on set, like the audition process and the sex and the set process are two different. It's two different things. Well, I didn't think about that. You didn't think about <laughs> <No>. that. <laughs> this is why you need to be in class, mate. I know. Um, I miss being in class. Mate. Yeah. No, I think you know. It's it's how how do you stand out? It's always about how do you stand out without without being contrived as well. Like you know, people. I think. people, People think about being bold, and then they just get ridiculous, and they just do they just do stuff that's just way out there and too much, and then it becomes distracting. But it's like mm-hmm. if you really think about it, from I always try and think about it from the casting director's point of view, right? Casting directors, they're fucking looking at actors all the time. They're looking at briefs all the time. They're looking at little fucking pictures of people's faces. Then they're looking at show reels. Then they're looking at self tapes. Like they're just. Like I spend a lot of time looking at actors and I don't look at actors anywhere near as much as casting directors yeah. do. So it's like, just how can you bring that one thing that just gives a little bit of something, like a little spark, a line that's just got a bit of a different spin on it, slightly different interpretation to the obvious read on the text. And like that might not be the read in the show and that might not be the right read, but at least it's going to capture the attention of the casting director or the director or the producer and be like, oh, well, that was nice. Out of the 30 people that we saw, the 30 brown haired fucking Russian people with beards that we saw, he was the guy that just did something a little bit different. And then, all right, cool. Let's get him in for a recall. Or cool, let's get him, let's get him penciled for this job. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's that's just what it's got to be. Well, <laughs> there is always next time. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm sure there's going to be plenty of Russian villain castings coming through for you. I thought so a year ago, two years ago. No, not, not that many. I think they disappeared at, at, at all. <laughs> well, maybe because of the controversy around that, you know, maybe it's just like, oh, let's move away from Russian. <laughs> maybe we're yeah. Russian villains for a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, like maybe in five years. <laughs> but it will be like full on, you know, villains like back in like Rambo 2 or like which part, like he was, he was fighting Russians quite a, a couple of times now. Who? Rambo. 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 I've never seen Rambo films, you know. First Blood is good. Yeah? Yeah, then it becomes a little bit like, yeah. First Blood is actually a really good film. Okay. I think, I think because he, he just plays this very like yeah, young guy who just went to Vietnam, I think, and he comes back home, like, and he just like, he's treated like shit. And he's like, it's basically, it's a drama. It's not even like an action film proper. Like, oh, really? Like, yeah. I mean, there is there is some action, but it's it's a good drama, I would say. But anyway, so let's let's come back to you. Maybe the next time when I interview Slay, Sly, then I'll talk. <laughs> so first blood. So when did you start writing? University. I I went to university. I went to university because I was like, you get a student loan, you get a grant, you get to spend money on beer, fantastic. Let's go. <laughs> um, but. I also went to uni for like, to like broaden my horizons. So that's certainly how I started treating it after like my first year. Um, You know, I'd already been working in TV. I was part of the drama society. um, So we were doing shows. So I was getting to focus on the sort of practicality. I was learning new skills. I was part of a community. I fucking loved all of that stuff. So I started looking at my degree as like, 
I'm not asked about getting a, I wasn't asked about getting a first. I was like, what the f- it doesn't fucking mean anything. Like, who gives a fuck a first in performing arts? It was just, you know, Scorsese is not going to be ringing me up being like, oh, I heard you got a first yeah. in your degree, mate. You know, <laughs> do, do you want a part in Godfather 4? Like, it's just, not, it's just well, first of all, I'm not sure if you would have to say yes to Godfather 4 probably would be sh- would have been shit. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I'd have took it out of uni. Fuck it. Um, I mean, if it's Scorsese. <laughs> you don't say no to Scorsese. I ain't going to say no to that. Um, so yeah, I guess my real start in, in writing would have been um, when I started my theatre company, we, we did a... We're fucking out there, really, when I think about it now. We did a stage version of a film called Dead on Arrival, um, which is a film that not many people would have heard of really. It's from like the fucking 60s or 70s or something like that. But at the time we were, the 39 Steps had come about, which is like a physical comedy. It's like physical theater mm. and sort of a bit slapsticky. And we wanted to do something like that. So we took this old script mm-hmm. and then we turned it into a theater piece. So I did a lot of the sort of rewriting on that and then the production that we did after that was, an, um, I did a, an original interpretation of Great Expectations by Dickens, who's one of my favorite writers. Um, and I wrote a full original script mm. for that out of the book. But again, this is not me coming up with my own material. I'm sort of rewriting stuff. And then after that, we did a rep season. So we did four plays in four weeks. And we did two adaptations and we wanted to do two original plays. Um, no, actually, now I remember what happened. We wanted to do a stage adaptation of Goodwill Hunting. Mm. And we couldn't get the rights for it. Of course. <laughs> Obviously. I mean, come on, Ben. Why, why are you not giving me the rights to your fucking film? Don't you know who I am? Um, but yeah, they... Did you try to get the rights? Yeah, I think we emailed like Ben Affleck's and Matt Damon's representatives or whatever to yeah. see if we could get the rights and they just fucking ignored us, didn't they? But, no. Um why um. <laughs> no I mean to be fair like if they would if, if, if it would get to their actual attention because they also guys who came from nothing yeah they they came like they like they kind of achieved something with their own writing like or, and working hard so maybe they could have like hey you know there is no harm in giving someone the rights to do like a few performances it's not like big West End uh, performance it would be like no. just a small performance somewhere like it, it, it wouldn't hurt them I don't think it's ever been done um, and fucking copyright if it hasn't been done. <laughs> um, I can't copyright someone else's work, but the idea. Um, you can copyright the idea. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> idea but doesn't work. You hit it her first. <laughs> um, I think it's more like, that's an amazing film. Um, like, I think a state adaptation would be sick. Mm. I feel like, like me personally, over my own work, if someone was going to do a st- the first stage adaptation of something that I felt really passionate about, which they must do, mm-hmm. I think I'd be pretty choosy over who I gave the rights to about mm. that. You know, it wouldn't have done any harm, I'm sure, mm. but I would still be fucking choosy over Maybe. it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we wanted to do that. We didn't get the rights, so we were pl- we were play down. Mm-hmm. So I was like, all right, fuck it, I'll, I'll write a play. But we'd left it right to the wire. We had like a few days before we went into rehearsal. Mm-hmm. So then I wrote, I pl- my first play I wrote in like, I think yeah, about four days, I wrote it. Which one was it? It's called Jukebox Baby. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, I, I mean, I personally think it's fucking shit now, but like when we did it, it got really good reviews and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, it did really well. Um, but I wrote a play set in New York which is like now, obviously me as a writer now, I'm like, why would you fucking choose to do what, that? What do you know about New York? I don't know, fuck all. I've been there on holiday <laughs> once. And I love West Side Story and some other films that I set there. Yeah. So I just had this like idea of like, I got this story and I was just like, yeah, everyone can have fucking American accents. And we yeah, just yeah. started like, yeah. So obviously I've been quite influenced by things like West Side Story, which I really like. Um, so yeah, that was my first play, but it was it was just so rushed and it was like we wanted something like Goodwill Hunting. So I sort of tried to write something like Goodwill Hunting without obviously ripping the fucking shit out of Goodwill Hunting. Um so yeah, it's not really like I wouldn't really class that as my first play, even though it was my first play. Um mm-hmm. yeah, that's that's I that's wonder- why I decided to write. It wasn't like I want to be a writer. It was like <laughs> we need a play, better write a play. Well, but then you you wrote it, like and you kind of Felt a taste for it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, and now, when you're writing now, what, what are you writing about? 
<laughs> is there like is there a theme? And there's a lot of working class stuff in there. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a lot of trying to highlight sort of I guess like injustice mm-hmm. and hypocrisy. Um, and I like putting stuff in there that sort of makes people feel a bit like, oh, I don't know if I should agree with that. I don't know if I should laugh at that. Oh, I don't know how I feel about that. Like, I feel there's a lot of hypocrisy in modern day society and um, and I find it, you know, I just find it kind of irritating really. And I try and tackle that with my writing. So yeah, the main things would be like the working class thing, this idea of like an opportunity, a better life, an opportunity of getting out of the struggle. I think they're probably the themes that come across. But I also just like, I like writing fucking funny shit. Like uh, that's the one thing I really like about writing is like the idea of, you know, oh, that, you know, that, that'll be entertaining or like, oh, that'll catch people off guard. And yeah, just sort of putting people in a, compromising people's morality. I Mm -hmm. love doing that. I just (laughs) love doing that. That's what, that, that's what inspires me to write, I think. Um, challenging people's perspectives of the world. Mm. That's what I really like doing. All right. And how did you get into teaching people? I worked for, um, uh, she's still a very good friend of mine. I don't get to see her very often. Um, uh, who was my dance teacher at university, um, a lady called Julie. And she had a theater and education company And when I come out of uni, I started working for her doing theater and education. But a lot of it, it wasn't just a play. You would do a play and then you would very much, it would be very much like working with the kids about the issues that have been addressed in the play. Um, And again, we would go to quite, um, what's the word, you know, areas that have a lot of poverty and very working class areas um, in Manchester. And we would do stuff about like alcohol abuse and drugs and, and, and worklessness and So that's sort of how I got into teaching really because I was working in schools, I was working with children and I was fulfilling a role as a, as a teacher. Obviously there was a performance element to it. And I guess through the, the experience that I got with that, I then started teaching drama um, at like private, private schools, similar to what I'd gone to as a teenager. Um, and I was teaching, I was teaching acting, but I was also teaching dance. Um, I had like most of my jobs were both. I was an actor, acting teacher and a dance teacher and even a little bit of singing at times. Um, not that I class myself as a particularly good singer. But um, so through the experience of doing that and through my experience of being a director and running my own company, when I moved to London the first time, I was able to apply for a job as a tutor at Identity. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, obviously I got that job. And then I started working as a tutor there and and then that was it really. It sort of mm. just sort of organically came together. There was never a moment of like, I'm going to teach people how to act. It was, I was like, ah, yeah, I have the skills to do this. Maybe I mm. should do that. It's better than fucking waitering. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah. like scraping around for money and being fucking skint all the time. Like maybe I should do something that's mm. a bit more worthwhile for my time. When was it when you started in identity? How how long did you have, have you been in in identity? Because I think I met you in was it 2017? Yeah, I think I started uh, um late 2016, mm-hmm. right at the back end of the year. Mm-hmm. 2017 was my first year there. Mm-hmm. Um, and so so before identity, you did it for like how for how long? What teaching? Yeah, adults or teen uh, kids. Adults um, and kids. <laughs> and how different is it to teach kids and adults? <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> there's a, definitely a joke in there somewhere. But um, <laughs> um, I hadn't been teaching adults. I think I've done a couple of one-off workshops in places where I'd been teaching. Where I'd been teaching kids, I was teaching for a school called Scream in Blackpool. And I think they opened an adult class or they opened like a a 16 to 18 year old class. So it was a bit more like working with adults. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've been teaching there for a little bit, but identity was my first sort of working with like, mm-hmm. you know, like the first time I was teaching people who were older than me, I found that really like bizarre actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
yeah, that was that took a bit of getting used to because I was only 26 yeah. um, when I started teaching. 20, you know, it's fucking young. Like <laughs> being 26 is like is young, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, to like hold a room, you know, like to lead people and to yeah. coach people and to have people challenging you as well. Um, how different is it from teaching kids? Yeah, a lot of te- a lot of the time when you're teaching kids is sort of classroom management because kids a lot of time kids see something to do with drama as just an excuse to fuck about. Yeah, so you're not really doing much of like you know working on the craft. You know, you're not <laughs> really getting to like feel the acting. Um, yeah, you're just it's you're trying to make it fun and you're trying to be like. Mm. Look at me, I'm fucking interested. I'm more interested than that wall. I'm more interested than the ball. I'm more interested than fucking pulling that kid's hair. I'm more interested in fucking trying to get your fucking trousers off in the middle of class. All the weird shit that you have to deal with with kids. It's like, no, 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 don't do that. No, 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 don't touch that. No, don't hit her. Like, it's just like constantly like you're fucking like, you know, kids are wild. It's great. They're great. But you're not doing much acting. Yeah. And obviously working with adults, I'm actually getting to do the thing that I want to do. Mm-hmm. Like <laughs> work on the acting. What did you learn in that time, like as a teacher, since you started uh, uh, teaching uh, grown-ups, <laughs> adults? Um, uh, people don't always want to hear the truth. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, that's been quite a big takeaway. Yeah. Um, I've always lived my life as like honesty is the best policy um, and like being real and being authentic is always the way that I want to like lead my life. But actually, you know, I think a lot of people live by ignorance is bliss. Mm-hmm. And um, what I've learned is you have to really manage people's egos before you can sort of coach them to where they need to be as a as an actor like mm-hmm. and i think you know a few people have told me over the years and, and and i do think it's true i think i'm 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 particularly good at like recognizing individuals people's needs and even teaching a group i'm still able to like pull out different aspects of what everyone needs on an individual level But because I, because of the way that I direct, because I'm just straight to the line, like, no, nah, that needs changing. Oh, this is this or, or whatever. I think some people find that um, very difficult to take. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, that's, I guess, a bit like eye opening and like a, and a different perspective that maybe I came into teaching with I just when I came into teaching I was just like people need people need to hear what they need to hear and, and that's the best thing um where now I do try and sort of I don't know I, I don't I don't pull any punches as you know but like I just try and just sort of sense out maybe where people are at mm-hmm. in their individual lives a little bit more and like I'd sort of tailor how much truth I might deliver to certain people mm. because people and at are, what point? <laughs> and at what point? Because they're not always ready to hear it. They don't always want to hear it. And even though I can plainly see what it is that needs to happen in order for that person to improve, they might not. <laughs> hey, come here. They might not actually be right. They might not actually be quite ready to hear it themselves. Well, I mean, if you're doing it for so long, I'm, I'm guessing you're enjoying uh, being a teacher. Uh, why? Do you know what? I don't, I don't, I don't really, and I've never really resonated with the title of teacher. Um, although I am, and I've taught a lot of people a lot of things. Mm. I, I, I think I prefer to, to, I've always preferred to look at myself as an artist and an artist who, you know, knows a thing or two and is able to communicate that well with other people. Um, and that is what I enjoy. Um, I enjoy, I enjoy art in many different forms. I mean, fucking the amount of titles you give me in that intro, obviously <laughs> indicates that, but, um, I enjoy taking someone from like being completely shit to like actually being like really good. Like, mm. I, like, and that, that I've done a lot of times and I enjoy seeing people at those breakthrough moments. Like I had one a couple of weekends ago, I was doing a weekend intensive and um, 
I won't I won't say her name just in case, but like she, you know, she trained at she trained at Arts Ed and like she'd been acting for a while. And I just did this exercise that you've probably seen me do. Where I'm just like, let's just say the lines to one another. Yeah, and I, I actually it. I actually did the script with her. Mm-hmm. Um because sometimes I find when I jump in as an actor, because I do really talk to people for real, it makes them talk for real as mm-hmm. well. And I think it just encourages a little bit. Sometimes when I have two people and they're not talking to it, then it takes longer. So I was like, let me just jump in. And I did it with, I only had five people in the workshop. So I just jumped in with them and I just sort of like, let's just say these lines. Yeah. And we did it. And then I said, right, like, you know, let's just progress it a little bit and let's put a bit of an intention in it. And then maybe on rehearsal three, she just had this like emotional breakthrough. She genuinely started to get upset. I could see the tears coming in into her eyes and she was like, and I caught it and we were only doing sort of three lines back and forth. And she was like, oh my God, like, I actually felt something for real that's never happened mm-hmm. before. And I'm like, there you go. That's it. That's mm-hmm. what we're here for. That's what I'm here for. Mm-hmm. That's why I'm doing it. I'm not doing it for any other reason. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's, you just had a real connection. You just had a real connection with yourself. You just felt something real out of nothing. Mm-hmm. And all we did was put you in a place where you felt connected to yourself and you felt comfortable in your own skin enough to just be like, I'm just going to say these lines to this person. Mm-hmm. And that's when the fucking beautiful stuff happens. And that's why I keep doing it. Because mm-hmm. when I see it happen and when I feel it, it's just mm-hmm. like, that's sick, you know? And I'm facilitating that. I'm, I'm making that happen for people. Um, and I think that's deeper than being a teacher. I mean, that is like, that is being a teacher. I'm teaching people how to do it. But I'm, in a way, I'm fucking like, I don't know. I'm, I'm helping to, I, I feel like at least that I'm helping to guide people to a place of like feeling more secure in who they are. And that's like, that's a sick thing to do, you know? Like, yeah. what a nice way to, to live a life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, totally so it's not like, oh, I'm an acting teacher. Yay. Like, mm. I don't really, I'm like, nah, <laughs> you know, I'm not, that's not really like what I see myself as. Mm. Um, yeah. So it's more like for you, it's more like collaboration in a way. Just artistic collaboration, just, you know, help, helping people grow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like, yeah. this is the script we're working on. We've got these two pages to work on for three hours. Mm. Obviously, everyone always gets up and has a go. Um, and that's something I've always been really, like, um, sort of precious about. Obviously, being an actor myself, I don't want to go to a workshop and not do any acting. I don't, I don't want to fucking sit in a workshop for three hours and only do two minutes of acting. Yeah. Like, I've done it myself. I've done it plenty of times and, and sometimes there is value in it. But if I'm paying 35 quid a week for a class, I want to be doing some fucking acting, mm. you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, that's sort of like, right, this is the material. How can we, how can we get into this? But how can we get into it in a way that feels right for us as the individual? Like how can we make it our own? Like, I love those classes when I see seven different interpretations of the script. It's the exact same writing, you know, mm-hmm. and I see seven or eight completely different interpretations of it. Like everybody brings their own thing to the table. And they're and, still like on the objective. And they're still on objective. It still makes sense. Yeah. And it's like, oh, mm-hmm. that could be a version of the film in itself. That could be a version. And mm-hmm. it's just like, we've got all these different fucking interpretations of the work and I'm just like wow like that that's mm. amazing mm. Um, and that I guess that comes into what you're saying about the collaboration side of things it's like yeah I'm sort of getting to them work with that and say oh maybe we push it like this here and we push it like that and then that's more my my directing side of things mm. which I am um, you know passionate about mm. yeah. let's quickly go through a technique that you use Okay. Yeah. So maybe like for people, if you want to join lead class, if you're curious about uh, what technique he, you know, he teaches, uh, what are the steps, like the most simple steps, what's based on, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's based on practical aesthetics, which is derived from David Mamet's book, True and False. Um, <laughs> so I'll try and keep this as simple as possible. Yeah. Um, what is the character doing? Literally. Um, what does the character want? So what's, well, that's the character's objective. Um, and what does that look like in my life? That's it, is, is in as simple a terms as possible. The progression from that is, okay, so we use as ifs. Um, you know, the character wants to make an ally. 
you know, it's as if I've, I've, you know, I've started a new job and I, and, and I need to get to know people around me so I feel a bit more comfortable. And then we start thinking about ourselves and what that looks like. How do I behave? What are my mannerisms like? What, what do I do with my vocals? Uh, my vocal tone, what's my physicality like? And you're, and you're starting to really picture yourself and getting the creative juices flowing. And then the final step, which I think is the most difficult step and people still really can't get their head around it, is the actor's intention, which is what effect do I want to have on the other human being in front of me? Hmm. Um, not a character, but you yeah, personally. Not, not the me character. Personally. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's the thing that people cannot get their head around, I think, is like, no, but the character wants this. No, but the character says that. And it's like, that's the, that's the script. Mm -hmm. The script is doing all of that for you. What are you doing? Mm -hmm. What are you, the person, doing? Um, and that's that's what the actor's intention is. And that's how it differs from the character's objective. Um, so, yeah, that's it. That's the technique, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, it's based on David Mallet. It's based on David Mallet. True and false. I said that already. Yeah, I know. I know. I, I'm just so saying it again. Just in case. Yeah, true yeah, and false. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good. True and false, David Mallet. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I have, I've moved, I've not moved away from it, but that, that's too strong. I've just, I have a, just a slightly different way of So you're building it. up on that technique, like your own way of teaching, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Own way of like working with, with a scene in general. Like if I was to do a practical aesthetics workshop, mm -hmm. that would be a different workshop to my regular screen acting workshops. Mm -hmm. If I was just teaching practical aesthetics, mm -hmm. I would set that out differently. Would be more more similar to what we did like in the very beginning when we started uh, well, when you started uh, your class, uh, like about finding two or three actors who would play you, finding your USPs, or is it kind of no? Because that's my own thing. That yeah, the casting bracket stuff. That's like mm. that's got nothing to do with David Mamet. Mm. Um, that's literally like my own thing. Mm. Um, but a practical aesthetics workshop would be. Um, what is the character literally doing? Um, what does the character want? And what tools do I have? I think they call them tools. What is the essential action is actually, I think, the terminology that he uses. What is the essential action, which I call objective? Um, and then you would just get up and do that. You wouldn't, go, you wouldn't talk about... You would talk about this actually. Yeah, you would talk about this. <laughs> yeah, maybe it won't be all that different. <laughs> <laughs> there are there are slight very there are slight variations, but mm. um, but David Mamet doesn't believe in character at all. Mm -hmm. I will talk about character. Mm -hmm. David Mamet's just like there is no such thing as character. That's in his book. There is no such thing as character. Mm -hmm. That's helpful for me. I, I'm like, yeah, of course. Then it makes me feel like, oh, I just need to be me. Mm -hmm. But for some, for some people, they're just like. They lose their fucking heads if you say there's no such thing as character. <laughs> they never, they never come back to class. Really? Yeah, this, this is crazy. It's, a, it, it's a cult. Um, yeah. So I don't, I can't really, I can't really use that too much. I do use it every now and again, but I see people like looking at me like I'm fucking. Mad. They're like, why am I paying this guy? He doesn't believe in character. <laughs> I'm here to be a character. Um, Building on this, like, so people don't come back, <laughs> which is, you know, which happens in every class. But the thing is, not every class. <laughs> I mean, like, I mean, which happens in every, like, for every teacher. Yeah, there every are people teacher. who come and don't yeah, come yeah, back, yeah, which yeah, is yeah. fine. Uh, every but, class has people leaving. <laughs> that is not true. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> people are leaving every class. <laughs> Lee is a very good teacher. You are a great teacher. I love you. Thank you. Um, how do you, because there's like, there are so many frauds. Yeah. They, like, I was, I was talking yesterday on the phone. With my friend Andre, Andre Noah, uh, he's also an actor, and he was just like talking to me about like this person who I will not name them. Uh, the, the person like he was like, they just got a tiny. They were a stand-in on Marvel film, and now they're selling themselves as a fucking like I made it. Come here. Pay me money. I'll teach you what to do. There no was way. like a BBC interview with them, <laughs> and I'm just thinking like this there, is. Is it's, there really a BBC interview? With yeah, them? yeah. And I'm just like seriously. Okay. There are like few credits in IMDb. Simple credits. Mm -hmm. Nothing special. Mm -hmm. uh, most of them were like kind of stand in, uncredited. Mm -hmm. Like it's like you 
haven't made it as an actor. I'm no. not bashing on like having those credits. It's fine to be a stand-in, an extra, like or whatever, like a body double or whatever. Yeah. But it's not like you haven't made it to Hollywood. No. But there are people like this, and they're selling themselves as like, well, there you go. I made it. Come to my class. I will teach you how to <laughs> how to how to define <laughs> those people. How for someone who wants to start acting to understand if it's worthy or not of their time to go to their class i guess i don't know I, you know we've already sort of touched on this a little bit about being sort of out of touch with you know your how you feel about you know your connection to yourself but i, I think you get a feeling for people don't you You get a feeling for a for a situation right i don't know sometimes there are people who can sell themselves so easily like and if you don't understand anything in the in the industry yet. Yeah. Or you don't really understand anything about acting yet. And then you come to their class or whatever, like workshop. Yeah. And you, you just you can see you see this like very self like kind of a person with big presence, someone who just sells themselves mm. so so well. It's hard to understand sometimes. So it's just like, what would be your advice to people who want to start acting? Like how to avoid that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, because this is something that genuinely pains me and has pained me when I've been to classes and when I've worked for other institutions and stuff like that about, you know, I've got a couple of people now that I've worked with for years who were complete beginners. And I don't know, maybe they would have found their way eventually, but I think I I believe that anybody can can do it. I think different people are more, uh, are more naturally gifted than others, for sure. But I think anybody can be an actor. And I just think there's probably a lot of people who you know, they go to the wrong, the wrong places and then they give up because of how they're made to feel, uh, the direction that they're given, the guidance that they're given. Um, so I don't think it's avoidable. I don't think you can avoid going to a place and having a shit tutor, shit tutor. And I don't think you can avoid going to a place and being taught by a fraud, but I do think you can sort of come away from an experience and sort of analyze why it's made you feel bad. But if it's something that you really want to do and you feel passionate about it, then just keep searching and keep, you know, keep looking for a good fit, a good fit for you. Someone that makes you feel encouraged, someone that makes you feel like you can believe in yourself and someone that actually is, is genuinely invested in you and, and your career and sort of harnessing what you have. Mm -hmm. Like that's, that's the important thing. Like, is the, you know, you go into a three hour class, are you leaving the three hour class feeling like they didn't really give a fuck about me? Like, that's not a good sign, you know? Like, are you, are you leaving a class feeling like I didn't get much contact time? Am I leaving a class feeling like I got a bit disregarded there? Like then they're not that for me, that's not a good sign. Mm -hmm. for, for an acting class you want to go to an acting class and feel like and it's difficult listen it's fucking difficult when you've got 16 people in a class for example how can you give 16 people attention it's it's difficult and it's not always possible but like you know you should you should feel encouraged and you should feel like you've been given at least one little bit of direction or feedback that feels like it's for you like it's specific for you it's not like a Guys, when we're doing singles, you have to you have to sit like this, you know, you have to favor the camera just like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. oh, great. Cool. I'm an actor now. Buzzing. <laughs> you know, I know this I know we have to do the technicals, we have to yeah. talk about the technicals, but like realistically, like being a good actor is about fucking harnessing your harnessing yourself, harnessing your own abilities, mm -hmm. your own character, your own personality, feeling good about yourself, overcoming your hurdles and your mental blocks. Like all of these things are so more so much more important, I feel. Mm. Um so then if someone's not giving you that, then fucking, yeah, move on. Mm. That's the only, I, I don't think it's avoidable because mm. the fucking industry is full of frauds. Yeah. It's absolutely full of frauds. Mm. Uh, so I can't give advice on how to avoid frauds because they're everywhere. If you mm. want to be an actor, get used to it. <laughs> um, Welcome. But yeah, yeah, yeah. But if, yeah, but if you're training and you're new, um, you know, and you've had a bad experience, that isn't a reflection of the whole industry. And there are people out there that are fucking, Really good, mm. really good. 
What what else do you hate about the industry? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me rephrase it. Not what else do you hate about the industry, but like are there any other things, like anything in the industry that right now for you is kind of like a pain point that you think like this really needs to change? Um Yeah, I think I think I think art's becoming too political. Mm. I think it's I think I think we've gone too far. I think we're going too far now. Um And I don't mean that in terms of like representation. I mean that in terms of like just how obvious it is when you're being force fed a, a political agenda. Mm -hmm. And I think there's too much of it now, um, especially in the more mainstream stuff, you know, just lines that are thrown in there that are no, no human being would just drop that into the middle of that conversation. It's just so fucking like, and remember, mm -hmm. be nice to people or, you know, whatever the fuck it is that they're trying to shove down mm -hmm. your throat. Um, and also the censorship that's going on now as well. Um, saw something the other day about something to do with arts council funding being stripped from certain things, being pulled from certain things. If there's a certain type of language that's being used or a certain type of language that's not being used, that's now part of the filter system um, to what's going to get money and what's not going to get money. And if art isn't going to challenge the status quo, what is going to challenge the status quo? Because mm. it ain't going to be fucking sports people because they're like, they're heavily now more than ever sort of uh, coached on what to say and how to behave and how to speak. Yeah. So are a lot of celebrities. I think musicians, they probably have, they have a little bit more room to sort of fuck about. But if if you challenge something that's, you know, currently trending, and you challenge it in the wrong way, then, you know, fucking, you're fucking shut down and all mm -hmm. the rest of it. Um, and I just think if, listen, going on fucking Twitter or whatever the fuck it's called these days and, and being fucking offensive to people is no way to change things. I think art done well is a good way to change things and is a good way to get a message or out there. Or at least just ask questions. Yeah, exactly. Because you don't necessarily need to have all the, all the answers. No, no one has. No, no. But at least you can ask questions even from from like from the mainstream agendas like well yeah but maybe yeah yeah exactly like yeah you know is this right like mm. what we're doing right now is that correct um man my problem with that is like not every story needs to be about like the mainstream the mainstream agenda that's going no, on right no. now not everything is about equality. I'm not against equality. I'm just saying that not absolutely every story should be about that. No, 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 exactly. Um, and it's the, the thing is about that as well is it starts to lose its meaning. Mm -hmm. You know, it starts to lose its, its impact. Like if you have a smaller number of sort of uh, films and theater pieces, but of real quality that are challenging, um, that, that has more impact rather than everything being a bit saturated with it and everything having to be like sort of ad adhering to it. Um, and listen, I've not watched everything. I'm not, you know, I, you know, it's a little bit of a generalization, but I, th I just find, I, I watched, I watched a play last week. I only watched the first half of it, actually. One of the cast members got ill part way through and then it, it couldn't finish. Um, and it was set up north and it was working class and The cast was predominantly women, so good, you know, good stuff. I know I'm, I'm, I'm all for it, um, but the audience was 90% white middle class at least, and it's fucking expensive as fuck to go to the theater. And I was just sort of like, what is this for? So we've got we got a working class story. We've got we got we got women on stage, and also it was about a Polish guy who was receiving prejudice in small towns and like, you're stealing all our jobs. And the Polish guy wasn't even played by a Polish guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and I just was like, I was fucking scratching my head. And I still can't put my finger on it really, but I was just like, what are we doing? What are we actually doing with our art right now? Like what, what is this for? Who is it for? Mm. Because if it's for entertainment and it's for the audience, Well, that audience is an extremely fucking 
elitist demographic. Mm-hmm. You know, it's part. It's it's elitist. The demographic is ninety percent white middle class people, mm-hmm. middle aged people as well. So the people that it's about, working class people from the north of England in this case, they ain't going to the fucking national to watch to watch that play. Mm. There's no shared experience. There's no relatability. Mm. And if it's and then if the play is about uh, the way we treat Eastern Europeans in this country, for example, the racism that comes with that, well, the fucking guy playing the part's not even Polish. <laughs> and he's doing a fucking terrible accent, and he's not acting very well either. Mm. So I'm like, I was just like, what? What is this for? And that that feeling that I had about that, I have on varying degrees about stuff that I watch on TV and I watch on theatre is like. Mm. Are we making stuff to move people? Are we making stuff to like entertain people? Or are we making stuff because we've been told by our superiors that we have to talk about that talk particular about, thing. Talk about that. Yeah. That we have to be seen. Mm-hmm. You know, it's the whole- the, 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 We have to be seen talking about that. <laughs> we have to be seen talking about that. And it's the whole thing. And again, I, I reckon this is probably a divisive, uh, opinion and people share it and people don't but it's the whole thing with like when it's pride and all the big companies get their fucking flags yeah. out and everything's colorful it's all about pride and yeah. we support the lgbtq plus community but is is it that's just a marketing strategy right of that, course that's just that company showing that we you know we're here for you mm-hmm. we're, we're here for mm-hmm. you like we're, here here's a new yeah. chocolate bar with like with the flag so no, maybe you buy it more of those now yeah, exactly <laughs> look at us we like we like gay people too mm. we've got we've got loads of kids in the, in third world making our clothes and shit mm. but fucking gay people <laughs> we're there we're right there for you like we're we're good people and that that's what i was saying earlier about the hypocrisy of things and stuff i'm just like it's fucking bullshit like mm. that is, it's just bollocks mm. but maybe people would say well at least people are aware of it and at least it's you know on a bigger scale in society we can all see and we can become aware of like actually you know yeah we need to do better in terms of the way that we treat uh minorities and stuff like that and i and i do and i see that as well and i see that with like other stuff in terms of like at least we're being made aware of it and it's sort of constant that we're being made aware of it and maybe that is the big picture um and maybe that is more important than the art being you know, amazing and really moving and all the rest of it. I don't know. Mm. But from an arti- from an artistic point of view, I find it is stunting mm. the, the quality of the work. If you have to think about what you're writing, if you have to think about what you're saying, is this going to offend someone? Mm-hmm. Is this going to, is this going to not, is this going to get shut? Is this play going to get shut down if I have that opinion? Mm-hmm. Is my film not going to get any funding if I, if I write this thing mm. in it? You know, like I've, I, the thing that I'm working on at the moment, um, like I've wrote a couple of things in there, which the character that I've, I've written, the world that he's from, would a hundred percent say those things. Yeah. But I'm like, I don't know if I can put that in my script because I feel like it's going to fucking upset somebody. Yeah. And I'm going to pitch that project to execs, and I'm like, if they watch that, and then they're like, they then decide that that's the, my opinion because mm. that's another that's another issue I've had over the years when I've written stuff. People treat you like that's your opinion because you're the writer. I'm like, no, I'm writing a world. I'm creating a world of other mm-hmm. people who have those opinions. But if I wrote everything that was just my opinion, what a fucking shit piece of work that would be. There, you know? there wouldn't be any conflict for sure. Yeah. Everyone would agree. <laughs> exactly. We're all agreeing with each other. Yeah. Yes, I like chicken. Yes, you like chicken? Yes, good. Let's all eat chicken. You want some chicken? Yes, I like chicken. Yeah, I also don't like that the people that made the decisions um, have absolutely no fucking artistic credibility. Mm-hmm. You know, the people with the money, people that are calling the shots, mm-hmm. are they artists? Are they fuck? I don't know. I yeah. don't know. Maybe some of them are passionate about it. Maybe not. But yeah, in general, passionate, maybe. Yeah. But, but I mean, like, dude, I mean, I do understand it. Like, if you need a lot of money to produce something, then it's a business. And then whoever gives you money wants to make more money or at least, you know, yeah. I do understand it. But unfortunately, it's such a huge limitation for people who just want to create. And I think I, from one point of view, I think now it's like we live in a time where like we have enough technology to do whatever we want. We can like we can make a film on a phone. Yeah, with just mics, it won't be, you know, like as amazing as like, so some cinematography maybe won't be as amazing, but you can make a product 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's from one perspective, it's kind of easier to show to people because we have YouTube, for example, or like some other platforms where like people for free can go and just consume a lot of, you know, films or videos or clips or whatever. But at the same time, there are so many of them that yours will be lost somewhere there. Like, so it's easier and harder at the same time to show something of yours to big amount of people because before there were like few few channels and there wasn't as many kind of content as well yeah now there's so much yeah. and you have no idea how to navigate it and how to find a good one <laughs> i know yeah how do you how do you sift through the shits yeah what was the last good thing that you've seen probably society of the snow it's about the um the plane that went down Mm. on its way to Chile. I think I've heard about it. Um, I think it's based on a real story. Right? Yeah, it's a true story, yeah. And they get stranded um, top of the mountain in the mm -hmm. snow. Yeah. And I've they have to start it. eating each other. Yeah. Um, that was really good. Yeah. Really moving. Yeah, I kind of like that it's a true story as well. Um, I don't always go for true story stuff, but yeah. What's next to you with the music? Next with my music. Um, so... We're working with the new team. We're working with Ribbon Rollers now. Um, my first single that I'm releasing like with them will be out on March 29th. Um, I've just got the artwork finalized. Um, I've just finished my, my music video for that. So yeah, we're just sort of this week, we're going to be gearing up to planning out the sort of the rollout, all the social media stuff, all the deliverables. Um, the radio pitches, the magazine pitches, all of that shit, basically. Mm. But it's my first single with this team, so it's all really new to me, so I don't really know exactly how that's all going to work. You know, I'm mm. sort of each day I'm learning something new, um, and I'm very much at the beginning of that journey. So, yeah, I've got to release five singles this year. Four of them are pretty much done. Got one more that I want to just develop a little bit more um, from a music point of view. Um so yeah, that side of things is, is, is kind of taken care of. So this year is about learning the business, probably starting to get some gigs on the go, developing a fan base, um, and yeah, just learning how it all works and like learning what my brand is. So I'm like fucking about with like, I'm just putting like stupid videos on TikTok and stuff at the moment just to see like what people connect to. Mm -hmm. I'm not necessarily putting it out there thinking, oh, I think this is good. I'm mm -hmm. just like, let me see what this mm -hmm. what, what, what happens if I put this out. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Do you have a lot of feedback from... from TikTok. <laughs> no, <laughs> but you can, you can see, you know, one video might get 200 plays mm -hmm. and one video might get a thousand plays. Mm -hmm. So I can see sort of like, well, I'm developing, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm using it as research. So I'm still very much in that research period, mm -hmm. but it's like, right. Okay. Well, the video that was 20 seconds and that had the filter that mm -hmm. did better than the one that was 45 seconds and mm -hmm. had no filter or the one that had a bit of text on it was da 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 or the one where I was being really silly people love that the one where I was being serious and I filmed it properly no mm -hmm. one gave a fuck about it mm -hmm. which is often the case which yeah. is really like a strange time as well like you know as, a, as, a, as an artist as a filmmaker you want to make sure everything looks great and no one gives a fuck about it you do something on your phone being a dick and everyone's like oh I love this and mm -hmm. it's like well that one took me 30 seconds yeah. that one took me fucking three hours yeah. And that gets nothing. Um, and like, I've just finished my music video and I'm like, I, you know, I'm, I'm really pleased with it. Um, especially because, you know, it was like me, Imogen shot one of the shoot days, Demi shot the other shoot day. We did like a few hours of shooting in total. I've edited it, I've graded it and it's come out really well. So I'm pleased with it. But I'm like, <laughs> will anybody give a fuck about any of that? Will anybody actually watch it? <laughs> the people are more likely to watch me fucking doing a stupid voice on my TikTok. You know, like they're probably more likely to watch that. That might actually be better for my career than me doing this. Do you know what I mean? It's just no, crazy. But I, th I think there's like, there's a big difference in, in consuming short form videos, like, you know, shorts on YouTube or like the, the uh, TikTok and longer form video videos. Like it's mm. different, completely different audiences as well. Yeah. So like, and, and the tendencies, how the people watch it, like also is very different, but, mm. but still, uh, one thing that I'm starting to understand right now, like, you know, with the podcast, even though podcast is, a, it's a very, very long form <laughs> format. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, it's a bit different, but like you still kind of start to understand all this 
things like you need to capture the attention as soon as possible. You like with podcasts, it's harder to do, or like with all the videos uh, on on YouTube, like it's just like you need to switch from like you know switch to different shots all the time, every three four seconds. Something should happen. Something like, and you kind of like. Come on, it's really like your attention span is so low now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember we were watching Star Wars, original Star Wars, like first 15 minutes, there was nothing was happening. There were two robots going through the desert while we were like, beep, 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 beep. <laughs> like, oh, to d to you, right? Blah, blah, blah. That was like the 15 minutes of yeah, <laughs> Star yeah, Wars. Yeah, yeah. And we were watching like, oh my God, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Now oh. everything like 20 seconds, two seconds. Yeah. Switch. But still, I think like it's a long form. In short form, and it's like it's consumed differently. So I, I wouldn't say like your music video consumption of your music video depends on how people consume your shorts mm. on TikTok. Mm. I would say, yeah, for me it's like I struggle with when I have spare time. I'm almost like there's so many different things I could do with my spare time. I don't know what to choose <laughs> to do with my spare time. I know exactly what you're talking about. And exactly it, what you're talking about. And it drives me mad. Because mm. then I'm like, and then I get stressed. Yeah. I'm like, I'm stressed out now. I don't know what to do. Do I want to read? Do I want to watch something? Do I want to play a video game? Do I want to fucking listen to a podcast? I want to do all of them. So then I try and do them quickly and mm -hmm. then I don't find it relaxing at all. I do yeah. all of them unrelaxed or I'll end up doing something fucking annoying like what I did the other night. I like to play chess. But if I play when I'm tired, I just get beat because obviously you're too tired. And I fucking spent like an hour and a half getting beat at chess. Mm -hmm. And I was so angry. Honestly, mm -hmm. like I was fucking fuming because I was like, you could have been doing all of those other things. <laughs> and it's fucking stressful, man. And I think that that, that sort of plays a part where people are, They're like, oh, well, I don't know if I want to commit to this. Mm. So let me have a walk quick, quick look. Oh, no, I'm not sure. You know, you're always like, sort of looking for that next best thing, isn't it? You're looking, oh, maybe I want to do that. Maybe I want to do, maybe I want to watch this. Maybe want, and it's like, mm. how do you get someone to invest and trust that the two hours that they're going to give to your podcast, they're not going to end it the way I am playing chess, mm. being like, ah, oh, fuck. You know? No, it's hard. No, I know. And that, that's the thing. But like, it's, it's hard to find uh regular viewers for podcasts rather than for short form like some some mr b stuff like because like this you know short clips that are entertaining podcast is different like but the thing uh you have less viewers for sure but the people who are actually listening to you yeah they are way more loyal to you because they are ready to spend like one and a half two hours with you mm -hmm. and they do it on a regular basis which is kind of like it's, it gives nicer connection Hey guys. <laughs> so uh yeah, it's 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 hard. It's hard. This thing, like honestly for me, this like this I'm learning so many new things. Like setting up the lights yeah. that you guys don't see, uh setting up the cameras, sound, then editing everything around like you know dogs running around like or like some noise in the window like or something it's just it's, it's so much stuff and then you have to publish it you need to create a thumbnail uh, the, yeah. the title and it's like a science on, on, on its own <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. much stuff um so yeah yeah it's this is kind of a uh, we'll see what's happened will happen with this hustle <laughs> yeah i just said uh, someone asked me a few weeks ago, like, oh, you know, like, why, why, why are you feeling better in, in, you know, 2024 or whatever? And like, aside from Pluto, um, <laughs> it's like, I just sort of, I was like, I've never been a big believer in just being productive for the sake of being productive. But I was like, you know what, if, if I can spend every day, like learning or focusing on something that I enjoy, actually what I'm doing and where I'm going to is not as important because like here and now yeah i'm doing something that i'm feeling like inspired by mm -hmm. um and it's like yeah i'm learning new things i'm learning new skills and is that not a nice way to live life like you know maybe yeah. that's you know that's enough and i'm starting to get used to that feeling of like well yeah that's enough like today you did some shit that you enjoyed mm -hmm. you learned some new stuff great just keep doing that you yeah. know and that's sort of where i'm at right now where in the past i've been like right well by april i need to have done that and then by june i need to have done that and by the end of the year i want to have done this and this and this and mm. this and then everything just becomes so like pressurized and stressful where actually i'll probably end up doing those things but in a much more organic way mm -hmm. so it's like you know all the shit that you're learning right now you know who knows are you going to be as big as joe rogan 
hopefully. <laughs> um, so, have you learned to uh, relax? No, mate. Um, <laughs> not a podcast doggo. <laughs> um, have I learned to relax? I'm getting better, right? Um, my therapy's helping. Yeah. So I started working with a new therapist in, in November last year. Um, and a lot of the reason why I think I've always found it so hard to relax is because I've fucking suffered with anxiety for most of my life, um, which, you know, trying to relax with anxiety is, is, is impossible anyway. Um, so I think as I've worked through that stuff, um, these last few months, things are starting to feel a little bit easier. Um, I definitely give myself more downtime than I did a few years ago. Um, mm. I just have this sort of insatiable fucking need to be like doing stuff all the time and to be productive all the time. And um, the only way I could relax was with fucking having a beer. And a lot of that has changed now. Mm -hmm. um, definitely. You know, well, it's changed out of necessity as well, right? Well, yeah, because of like your 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 uh, long COVID. Is it like long COVID in here? Like, have have you have you came like have you come to conclusion? <laughs> I don't think so. Um, so basically, what happened? You got COVID. Yeah, it was what twenty 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 twenty. Yeah, and then yeah, but I don't. I think COVID might have played a part. Um, but basically, you know, Imogen, my girlfriend, had a really bad accident. And then two weeks later, I woke up in the middle of the night and I fainted. And then I got up the next day and I was, I just had this like dizziness, basically this sort of disorientated feeling. But at the same time, I had this sort of fluey feeling as well. And I thought at first the dizziness was just a symptom of having like this flu and that it was just going to clear up and go away. Anyway, I think the flu was most likely COVID. I never got tested at that time, but a few people around me had tested positive for COVID. Um, so then for a while it was this, oh, you've got long COVID. Um, not that that was particularly helpful because nobody knows what the fuck to do with long COVID. Mm -hmm. And it's no one knew what to do with short COVID. No one knew what to do with fucking short COVID. Yes. It's almost like an imaginary illness in a way. Um, but yeah, people were uh, sort of from a medical point of view, I guess we're approaching it with that in mind, but And what, where I'm at now is I've been diagnosed with PTSD and CPTSD, which is complex trauma. Um, and my thought is that the symptoms that I've experienced are much more to do with my, my PTSD and my complex mm -hmm. trauma than they are to do with long COVID. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think COVID would have fucking helped. Like, at the end of the day, mm -hmm. it's a fucking nasty virus, probably a fucking man-made virus not good to have in your body no. but uh maybe it was, that was the straw that broke with the donkey's back or the camel's back whatever mm. whichever version you want to use I, i didn't know either of those I versions, know, versions yeah, yeah. <laughs> um and yeah i think it was a contributing factor but the studies that i've seen around long covid Uh, it's a lot of the stuff that people that continue to suffer is the it's the lung thing that like they have the the issue with with breath with breath work um <laughs> They, um, they can't, you know, they still struggle to breathe. They get out of breath really easily and stuff mm -hmm. like that. It never affected my lungs, COVID. I've mm -hmm. had COVID three times, not once as I've, have I had like shortness of breath or mm -hmm. any of that stuff. Um, so yeah, the health thing has been, has been hell. Um, it's been what, like four years now? Through three. Three years. Yeah. Yeah. You know, all like constant dizziness. Yeah. I've been fatigue. Dizzy. Yeah. Permanently, permanently dizzy now for three years. Um, permanent blurred vision, permanent feeling in motion. Um, the fatigue has been, uh, this, these last sort of two or three months has been the first time that I've had feelings of not having fatigue on a daily basis. Um, some days I just wake up and I'm like, oh my God, I have loads of energy, mm. but I have to be careful. I can't be like, right, bam, let's go and fucking do loads of stuff. because then that can sort of send me into like a little bit of a relapse. Um, so I've had to learn a lot about myself. I've had to learn a, a lot of, of how to relax, how to manage my energy levels. Um, it's been something I've been thinking about recently as well. Like, can I, you know, can I 
you know, can I somehow use my experience to help other people that have been through something similar? Because um, my way out of it has certainly not been through a Western approach to medicine. Mm-hmm. It's not been the way out for me. Mm. And the times that I've tried that has not helped me. It's not benefited me at all. Everything that I'm doing is more holistic, it's more spiritual, um, meditations, manifestations, working on myself, therapy. These are the things that are making me feel better. Seeing a chiropractor, you know, shit that your local GP does not yeah. necessarily prescribe. Or it doesn't even count as, a, <laughs> as medicine. It doesn't even count it. Thinks, yeah. it. thinks it's nonsense and it's not going to mm. make any difference. Like, you need these pills. Mm. You need to do this. Mm-hmm. You need to not eat that. It took a lot of time for you to to kind of adapt to this way of living because you were very extremely productive before, right? You were doing shit all the time. So then yeah. at some point you kind of were at a place where you're like, I can't do shit. I couldn't do anything, man. Yeah. I couldn't even walk for five minutes. Mm. Actually, right at the beginning, a shower would be enough to make me have to stay in bed for the day. Like if I took a shower, that was it. That was mm. my activity for the day, having a shower. No. Then I'd just have to lie there. Mm. and fucking stare at the TV or even watching TV that was so uncomfortable because I had vertigo mm. a lot of times I'd just have to lie there maybe listen to something mm. no I remember I remember you were like in a very bad shape I mean like you you were you were like basically tired all the time <laughs> yeah like completely like you know out yeah. of exhausted yeah mm. yeah I was fucked man mm. I was completely fucked you, you went a long way <laughs> I've come a long way yeah I have come a long way yeah, yeah and I think it's important to remember that as well for myself like just how far I've come because I look back sometimes and I'm like fuck me like mm. you know I'm still not out of it and I still think I've got probably a fair bit to go until I'm completely free um, of symptoms but where I am now from where I was like three years ago two years ago even a year ago is um, is huge um, and the way that I've got there is I don't know. I just, I just feel like how much I've suffered. The idea that there's probably loads of people suffering as well. Like I would like to help that. I would really like to help ease other people's mm-hmm. suffering. Mm-hmm. And I just don't quite know how to do that yet. Like mm-hmm. I could do the whole going down like the social media route and creating content and stuff like that. But I already do so much of that mm-hmm. stuff. Um, just having a bit of structure as well of, to like actually what has really worked for me because it's not been like you know oh you know cut those things out of your diet and like get up at seven o'clock every day and have a cold shower and a meditation like yeah sometimes i do those things and i feel good for it mm. i don't do it every single day yeah and that's been the weird thing about it is like the world sort of wants to sell you uh, a remedy um And I think everyone thinks there's some sort of solution to their problems. Like uh, if I do this step and then that step and then that step, that's going to result in mm. whatever. And then you can apply that to anything. And I think people think you can apply it to health. That's what I mean about the Western way of doing things. It's like, well, if you do this and then you take this and you have that, then hopefully you'll be better. And it's like... Well, to, agree, to a degree, I think you can. I mean, you know, yeah. if you like eat less and exercise more, you should feel better. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, yeah, that. That is definitely true. If you eat less and you exercise more, you're going to lose weight. You're going to feel better. But if you have like what are these invisible, you know, these invisible illnesses like chronic, yeah. chronic fatigue, any sort of autoimmune disease, so so many so many diseases. And to be honest, I'm getting to the point now where I believe like pretty much all all disease is born out of um, some some form of trauma, some form of unaddressed fucking shit that's gone in, gone going on inside of your body and is and now has, has forced its way out um you can't you you can't get over that with mm. with medication you can't you can't get over that with just like fucking choosing to live differently you've got to actually go and actively work on that thing mm-hmm. but discovering what that thing is is mm. also like there's yeah. layers upon layers and that's what i found like i've been like Oh, yeah, that that's a really unhealthy habit. Oh, that's a really like, yeah, that's a thing that you probably shouldn't do with your life anymore. And it's like, right, okay, fine, I fixed it, I found it. And then there'll be another layer. And mm-hmm. it's like, oh, you know, and even now after three years, I'm like, I've just had one, like another one recently, like a breakthrough thing where I'm just like, oh, fucking hell, that must be like really damaging to yourself, actually. Like, 
uh, I quite often try and make other people feel more comfortable at the at the expense of my own comfort. Yeah. And I know a lot of people do that. But if you think, if you live your fucking life like that all the time, you're constantly putting yourself in discomfort. Yeah. What's going to happen to your body? What's going to happen to your mind? You know? This. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's certainly not going to be positive, you know? Mm. Um, and this literature is out there for people to read and to learn from. But one, it isn't the mainstream Western way of doing things. It certainly doesn't make Big Pharma any money. Mm. And and two, co- you know, coming off the back of what you're saying about people's attention spans and stuff like that, people don't want to do all of that. Like, oh, I, you know, I've got this illness, and this was my attitude when I first got ill. Well, how long is it going to take until I'm better? We don't know. Mm. What do you mean you don't know? Mm. Well, I don't know. It could take months. It could take years. What? Mm. Like, I get. I used to get. I still do. I fucking fume in if I'm ill for a day. A whole day not being able to do all of my productive stuff, all of my important things. What? A fucking whole day? No way. And I, I don't want to be ill. When I've been ill for a week, oh my God, it's the end of the world. To be ill for fucking three years is like, it's mm. crazy. People don't want to do that. Of course people don't want to do that. People want to get on with their fucking lives and enjoy themselves. People sometimes don't even have that time. I mean, like they kind of might find it, but in general, like most people are busy surviving. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and add another thing on top of this when you don't really know if it if it's gonna work or not, and like, and also like you you don't know like how to how to separate some bogus from actual practices that work. Yeah, yeah, no, a hundred percent. Yeah, so it's much easier to just say like, yeah, here's these pills. You're yeah. gonna feel better once you take them, mm-hmm. and then and you can still go to work. You can still look after your kids. Mm-hmm. You can still go and see your friends on the weekend. Mm-hmm. People are gonna go, yeah, okay. Or you can do a fucking journey of self-discovery. Don't know how long it's going to take. Yeah, you don't know what you're going to discover. <laughs> uh, well, exactly. And people are like, oh, well, actually, I'd rather just, I'd rather just keep pushing that down. I'm just, I'm just going to keep ignoring that. But that shit is going to come and, it's going to come and fucking bite you on the ass at one point. Uh, well, I'll be long dead by, the, by then. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> All right, look. What do you want to say to people who want to come uh, study with you? I think if you want to get, if you want to, if you genuinely want to be a really good actor and you want to, you want to know what it feels like to like really be in the moment and really be connected to another actor, then you need to come and join with me. Mm -hmm. Because there's not that many places that are doing that. Is there anything that you think people can do to prepare themselves for acting before they join any class at home by themselves? Are there any steps they could take? Any books they could read? Or reading books before you start practicing doesn't... doesn't yeah, I, I mean, I would read True and False. Do you, know what I would, do you know what I would do, actually? That's a good question. <clears throat> I would find out why you want to be an actor, what, what is motivating you, And I would also try and identify all of the reasons why it scares you. That's what I would do. If why? if I could if I could like go back in time. Yeah. Um why? Because those are the things that are gonna stop you from being a really good actor. The things that scare you. Yeah. And the th- and and not only the things that scare you, the things that make you really want to be an actor, yeah. they're probably gonna get in your way even more than the things that scare you. Because they might be false for the kind of actually being a good actor or because you will want it too much and it will kind of fuck you up. Yeah? Yeah. So I think the thing that I've seen the most actually, and maybe could have answered your question earlier with this, is that the thing that stops people from being really good is their desire to be really good. And is their desire to succeed. Mm-hmm. They want it so bad that when it matters, the pressure is too much. Yeah. The pressure that they put on themselves and all of the nerves that comes with it and all the insecurities that get brought mm. up when the camera goes, beep, all of that shit fucking rears its ugly head and it stops you from being able to be in the moment. It stops you from remembering your prep and you suddenly become fucking hyper aware of yourself 
yeah. and the fact that everybody's watching and oh my god I want to do a really good job and oh my god if I don't get this right now I'm shit and if I'm shit I, I can't be an actor and I'm not going to succeed and that's the thing that I really really want to do and like whether you're conscious of it or not that is what is happening so it'd be great if you could deal with all of that before you started acting. That's what that's what I would say. But you can deal with it. You're not going to be able to deal with it before you start no. acting because all of that stuff's going to get brought up. Mm. But I think having an awareness of why, mm -hmm. I think would actually be a really good starting point. Mm. So yeah, you could read books. You could do vocal exercises. You can fucking shoot some self tapes. You can read some scripts. Mm -hmm. All of that stuff's good. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Crack on. But the shit that's going to stop you from succeeding is 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 the shit. Does it still happen to you? Because you're like, you have a lot of experience. You've been doing acting for quite a long time. <laughs> yeah. And you're kind of help people find actors in themselves. Yeah. Does it still happen to you when you press record? Sometimes. Yeah? Yeah. Just, a, just a, there's just another, a deeper level of awareness of self that comes in. That mm -hmm. isn't necessarily helpful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When the camera goes on. I definitely sometimes feel that layer of tension kick in mm -hmm. and I can then if I watch my tape, I can see it. It's very subtle. It's very small. Just a little bit of tension in my body, a little bit of tension in my face, maybe even in the voice. Um, it does still happen, but not very, not very regularly. Mm. I've sort of locked a lot of that shit down. It's, it's that thing where you feel like, oh, I've, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sorted now. I've got, I've, I've got my shit locked down. I'm confident. I, I know I'm good and all the rest of it. But then there's always going to be something that comes along that, mm. you know, if if my if my dream role came through now for a self tape, yeah, you know, can I still hold my nerve? Mm. I think I could. I definitely think I could. But then on the recall, mm. when I'm in front of the director and I know that there's maybe only another five or six actors in contention, can I still hold my nerve? Yeah. And then when I get on set and I'm working with a director that I've always wanted to work up with, can I still hold my nerve? Mm -hmm. I think yes, but these are like the things that I think a lot of actors don't think about. Like being professional is being able to do it when it matters. Mm -hmm. It's all right being fantastic in your living room on your own, but like, can you do it when it means a lot? Mm -hmm. When the contract is 50 grand, like, mm -hmm. can you still do it then? You know, like that's, so yeah, I think I can. Mm -hmm. And I do still get nervous, but I think I, mm -hmm. I've been doing it for long enough that I'll, I'll be fine. But also I'm yet to have like what I feel like would be like my breakthrough role. I still feel like I've, that's not happened for me. Mm. I've still not had something that I could really get my teeth into in a, mm. in a TV or film setting. What would be your ideal role? One that's already been done. Like if I was to, or like it. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe the type of, of, I don't know, a film or a show that you think you would be like, you just would love to be a part of. My favorite show, oh, I mean, my favorite show is actually Succession. Mm-hmm. But my favorite UK show was This Is England. Um, so I would love to have been a part of that. But a part that I would have really liked to play, probably something like True Detective, mm. you know, 10 one hour long episodes where I could really just fucking like yeah. get into it. And also, a, you know, a slightly corrupt detective is, is pretty much my cast, would be my casting, you know, mm -hmm. someone who's seen some shit and like, mm. Yeah, at his high, he wants to do good, but he's going to do it in the wrong way. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> that's sort of like that's my bag, that's my mm. ballpark. So something like True Detective would be sick. Mm. I love loads of gangster shit, so something that would be like like Jimmy in Boardwalk Empire. That that would be one of my dream roles. Mm. Like Michael Pitt played. Yeah, I think I, I I think I am more turned on by the idea of doing a series mm -hmm. than a, than an independent film than a than a film in. Feature film, basically. Yeah, feature film. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I mean, I'd love to do a film. Mm. Um, but yeah, just, I don't know. I quite like the idea of, I don't want to work all the time. Like, I'm not one of those people that just wants to, I don't want to be on set all the time. Well, I don't fucking want to be on set all the time. <laughs> no, thank you. I want to be out walking my dog. I want to be going to the gym. I want to be doing sport. <laughs> I want to be doing my music. I don't want to be on set all the time. But I would love a three or four month project where I'm completely immersed in the world. That would be sick for me. Mm -hmm. But maybe just one project a year. Mm -hmm. Like that would be fine for me. Yeah. I don't want to do anything all the time. Mm -hmm. I'm just not like that. I, I get bored so easily. Like, I mean, you, you want to have a life as well. <laughs> um, I do love being on set though. I love being on set. I love being around it. Even if, even when I'm not acting, like I just love sort of, I love that, that, that everyone's got a shared, a shared goal. You know, everyone's mm -hmm. there to try and make that project come to life. 
um, and it's fucking hard work and I sort of like that everyone kind of mucks in and everyone's a bit tired and I do love that about it but it's I, you know I find it I think the longest projects I've done I did two weeks of basically solid filming and that you know it was where? Um, that was on Casualty in Cardiff but I was sick I loved it you know like I was in a hotel in Cardiff and stuff and I love all that side of things as well like you mm. know like going out for a drink afterwards and, and all that kind of stuff. Like I like that. I mm. like I really like that. Mm. Um, but yeah, to to do it for like four months, mm. six months even. I came really close to getting a Mike Lee film a few years ago, which would have been a mate. That that would have been my breakthrough. And the whole audition process took fucking six months. It was like wow. three, <laughs> yeah, it was like three rounds, and it was like they're still interested in you. And then after like two months I hadn't heard anything I was like oh it's definitely gone mm-hmm. then my agent ran me and was like oh by the way you're still in contention for that and I was like what mm-hmm. it's like I auditioned like fucking six months ago yeah yeah but we're going to find out in the next few days whether or not you get it and then it was like okay fucking hell wow and then a the whole like getting your hopes up thing again which mm-hmm. is just so exhausting fuck my, this, you know this is going to be my thing mm-hmm. and then it went again but that project was going to be I think it was three to six months worth of rehearsal to develop the film because that's how he works he develops his works through the act like yeah. you act and improvise and he writes the script which I would love to do yeah. I would absolutely love sounds, to do it sounds amazing to me yeah right? fucking brilliant like but I think it was three to six months of rehearsal and then minimum three months of filming the film because it mm-hmm. was I think quite a lot of stuff mm-hmm. so that you know I think it was I think they wanted the, the, the contract was for a year basically that they were going to book you out for yeah a whole year on one film like sick yeah. sick but like also like imagine that like that's tiring man you wouldn't work all the time though no you wouldn't you work would, all the time there definitely would be yeah. like some periods of time when you just like have some you know time off and then definitely. it's fine yeah definitely definitely i'd love to do it but listen don't get me wrong i would fucking love to do it um but there's a lot of things that i think are really important to me and again coming back to the health thing that a few years ago, if you'd asked me that question, I would have been like, yeah, I just want to be on set all the time. Mm-hmm. I want to just be working all the time. Mm-hmm. Like acting, I want to just be an actor. I love acting. You know, I had that. I had that. And I still have it. But I've realized that, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot to life. And there's a lot of stuff that's important in life. And mm-hmm. it's not all about being an actor, you know. Mm-hmm. It's about fucking like enjoying your relationships. It's about enjoying being fucking outside and mm. taking time to just do the things that you want to do, you know. I'm just thinking, how possible is it to be a successful actor? And by successful, I don't mean like famous. I mean like actor who works and just can live by just working as an actor, which is what like, you, you tell me, like ten percent of actors. I think it's I think it's only one percent of actors yeah. who actually can just live purely off acting. Which I is, think there's ten percent of actors that are working, like from time to time. <laughs> they're making money off it. Yeah. But I think it's only 1% of them that are, or is it, I mean, um, my my optimism wants to be like, no, it's 1% of actors who are like mm. millionaires and it's 10% of actors who are making a living off it. It, mm. could, be, it could be that way around, to be fair. Mm. But even 10% is quite small. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like it's, you have to be a little bit obsessed. Oh yeah. To do this, for sure. And when you're a little bit of obsessed, or obsessed a lot, it's very hard to kind of, not to look at it, it's just like, this is just one part of my life. I also have this and this because like when you're obsessed this is like the part of your life yeah I think obsessed has negative connotations with it you've got to be fu- you've got to be in it and you've got to be fucking in it completely you've got to be committed 100% to doing it you can't you can't half ass it because it's too fucking difficult I think the rejection and the and the not getting ahead it comes to it becomes too much when your life is just acting Yeah. So when everything in your life is to do with acting, I'm getting up today and I'm doing acting. I'm getting up today and I'm doing emails. I'm getting up today and I'm going to classes and and I'm just gonna I'm gonna watch films and I'm gonna research and I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do that. Like I think those things have its place and to immerse yourself in your craft is an amazing thing to do and it and, and you need it to get better. But if there's nothing else in your life that you're fucking enjoying and getting fulfillment out of, when that audition comes through. You're going to be like, I have to get this part. I have to get this part. And what's that going to do to you? Mm-hmm. It's going to fuck you up. Yeah. You know, it's going to get in the way. And that's what I'm saying about like, 
there's there's more to life, you know. There's other important things that you can enjoy that are gonna make are gonna make you feel fulfilled mm. as, as much as like acting or whatever. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Well, look, we're starting losing light. Uh, what's next for you? Is there anything apart from music that you're planning uh, that mm. there's that's happening? I know I'm planning. I've got a got a film project that I'm working on, which is about um, a working class mother who ends up um, developing cancer. Um, but I'm approaching it from, you know, cancer has been done, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know. Um, but it's more about coming back to what I was talking about with the health thing before is about the struggle. The struggle is going to catch up with you at some point. It's going to manifest as something at some point. And I think working class mothers potentially have the hardest time of anybody in this country because there isn't enough support. The benefits don't really give you enough to actually live any sort of life. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to get rented accommodation if you're on benefits. Um, if you're single, which is what I'm talking about, single, single parent working class mothers, you've got to look after your kids. You've got to feed them. You got to dress them. You got to take them to school. Like all of this stuff, um, and I just don't think there's enough representation for that, and there's not enough being done about it. Um, so that's what my film is about. But I'm I'm doing I'm going to do two concept pieces around it. So one of them is just one long scene, which I've never done before. I just want to try it as a as a way of sort of pitching it. And then I've also got like more of like a kind of eight or nine pages of like a short film. So I'm going to shoot both of those and mm. then, yeah, hopefully like reach out to some of the contacts that I've got and see if we can make that happen as a film or as a TV series or whatever. So that's, that's, that's in the, in the pipeline. And then, yeah, the music stuff, like I said, I've got the five singles to release. So it'll be music video content um, and all the rest of, all the rest of that stuff. And then just seeing what else comes up along the way, man. Mm. Nice. Sounds good. Are you shooting it yourself? Um, no, I don't think so. Actually, I've got a got a DOP interested, just very organically. Nice. Um, who thinks they you know they can bring pretty much a whole team on board without mm. me needing a budget? Nice. So we should be able to shoot similar to the quality that we had with Waving at Strangers. I yeah. should basically be able to shoot to a really high quality. Yeah, yeah. Without. Waving at Strangers was like it's what, what was one of the best things I did. It's such a shame that like it was a pilot that Lee wrote and directed. It was it was great. And I'm still bummed that it didn't pick up. <laughs> no, we came so close as well. Mm. It's such a hard industry, man. We had three or four people that really were really close to sort of mm. picking it up. Um, but we go again. Yeah. You know? Yeah, sure. Look, let's go to the through the Blitz round. Blitz round. Blitz round. Very short uh, questions. Okay. Quick answers. Yeah. Ready? Yeah. Texting or talking? Talking. Cats or dogs? Mm. Dogs. <laughs> uh, your one guilty pleasure? Uh, digestive biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> What makes you laugh? Um, my girlfriend. Nice. <laughs> What makes you angry? <laughs> <laughs> um, people who walk in diagonals on the pavements. I'm with you there. Uh, do you have any nicknames? Yeah, quite a few. Lee Bob, Lenny Bobster. <laughs> Where's it coming from? My parents. <laughs> um, Boaty. Um, legal. <laughs> um, Mr. Baby. That's one of my girlfriends. That sounds like it. <laughs> <laughs> I would guess so. Um, yeah, you can refer to me as any of those if you like. All right. All right, Mr. Baby. <laughs> <laughs> alien or aliens? Alien or aliens? Aliens for Ridley Scott or aliens from James Cameron? I haven't seen any of them. Oh, my God. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, 
podcast is over. I'm not even releasing it. Like, really? You haven't seen Alien and Aliens? You, no. uh, you're you less of a friend for me now. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I'm here for any aliens that want to come through now. <laughs> All right. Uh, your favorite character in any fictional story, like book, screen, video game? Don Corleone in The Godfather. All right. Star Wars or The Lord of the Rings? Ooh. Yeah. Uh, fuck. Uh, I'm going to stick with my, my childhood favorite, and that's Star Wars. Uh, do you have any unknown, unexpected talents? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Football, maybe? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've just started playing semi-pro football, so I must mm. be all right. So you're you're semi pro now. I'm not getting semi pro. Yeah, it's a semi pro club. I yeah. don't have a contract. I'm not yeah. getting paid. Yeah, but it's a semi pro. It's a semi professional club. It's nice. In a, it's in a pretty high up league. Mm. Going back to, to coming coming from the you know being tired from just taking a shower. Exactly. Yeah. This is this yeah, is yeah. huge progress. <laughs> yeah, I played my first ninety minutes on Saturday actually. Yeah. Yeah, it was nice. It was brutal. But a whole ninety good. minutes. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I didn't have fatigue and like and dizziness and shit. I wouldn't be able to play that too. No, yeah, I mean, it's, and it's, it's, it's a fucking high standard of, of football as well. Yeah. Everyone's fucking fit and young. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm, th I'm fucking 33 now. Come on, guys. Um, but yeah, that would be my, my hidden talent. Nice. I still feel very insecure about my football ability though, so I don't really like to say it. But yeah, you said it. You said it for me, so. Yeah. Do, we'll do, do you it. feel secure about your acting? Like, like, secure. Do you, secure like when like do you have the same thing that's almost all like to have like i can't watch myself act like do you do you have imposter syndrome or like anything like no nah, no nah, i will be i will be very unhumble for us i i i, I like watching myself yeah. act because nice. because i've got to the point that i try and teach is like I, i try and act from a place of truth and authenticity and i think if you act from that place And you don't feel too bad about the way that you look and stuff. I, you know, I rip myself apart about my fucking my hairline or my teeth or whatever. But my actual acting, uh, I like my acting, man. I like nice. it. Yeah, nice. Well, take example from Lee. All of you. Well, I mean, you should be good as well. <laughs> But still, it's better. It's better to like yourself rather than hate yourself. Yeah, you're not going to get anywhere. Productive. You're not going to get anywhere with that fucking self hating shit, man. Mm. Got to look. Got to got to push through. Yeah, love yourself. All right. How often do you cry? Uh, probably at the moment, maybe once every two or three weeks. Over the last three years, it used to be a lot more. Mm -hmm. It used to be weekly. Mm -hmm. There was a period of time where it was almost every day because mm -hmm. I was I was in a real bad place. Yeah. But yeah, now I don't cry as much now. Nice. Once every two or three weeks. I love a cry now. I love it. Mm. It's uh, it's cleansing, you know. Mm -hmm. It's healing, mm -hmm. releasing. So it's your it's your body's way of rebalancing your nervous system. So why would you not want to do it? Yeah, I get to try. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How can people reach you if they want to work with you or they want to study with you? Um, email me. Yeah. Better off emailing me. If you if you WhatsApp me, I'm definitely going to ignore you. Um, and then check Working Actors Studio site as well. Yeah, Everything exactly, is yeah. right here. All the information. Yeah. All right. So I asked you yesterday, I think, to prepare one cool thing. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything that you love and you think our viewers would love to? Gabo Mate's book, The Myth of Normal. Mm -hmm. And that's changed my life. I read it about a year ago. It's changed my life. What is it about? It's about trauma and healing from trauma and about how trauma is not just going to war or having something really bad happen to you as a kid. And that's big T trauma. Small T trauma is all of the little things that have happened to you in your life that you've had to adapt to deal with, to survive. And I've shaped you as a person and I've not necessarily shaped you into the person that you want to be um, and how you can change that and how it's never too late to, to become the person that you want to be. And it's never too late to deal with the issues that are holding you back in your life. And I just think it's an amazing book. And Gabba Mai is an amazing person. He speaks with truth. He speaks with authenticity. Who is he? Is he a psychologist? 
certainly a therapist, philosopher. Um, he's an expert on trauma. He's an expert on ADHD, which is everyone's got fucking ADHD now, which I don't think is true. I think that a lot of people have complex trauma, which have the same symptoms of ADHD. Um, I would 100% look him up. I would 100% read that book or watch some of his podcasts. He is he is challenging societal norms. He is challenging the approach to parenting. He is challenging the approach to the schooling system. He is challenging the approach to medicine. Um, and he's a fucking amazing person. Mm. And that book. Check it out. Check it out. <laughs> All right. I think that's it, man. Thanks so much for your time. It was great. I hope it's not the last time. No. We'll do it again for sure, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So expect more. See you. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs>